and also the best friend. So when the mind is connected with the proper mood of devotional service, it's your best friend. And when it takes you away from that, it's your worst enemy. And the closest thing to us is our mind, because it's so close that we sometimes identify ourselves with the mind, although we're not the mind. It's an instrument of the subtle body that uh, is the seat of our um, emotions, desires, and motivations for activities. So now he's talking to his mind. He's been talking to his mind for the last seven verses. Now we'll go to verse eight. Um, ready? We've been doing this responsibly. I, I speak and you just respond. Ready? Okay. Even though I am a cheater, the Lord's mercy can drive away my inherent wicked nature. Give me the glowing nectar of divine love. Inspire my heart with the process of worship of Sri Sri Gandharvika. With the process and inspire my heart with the process to worship Sri Gandharvika. Therefore, O oh mind, with pleading words. We should worship Sri Gidigari here in Braj Vrindavan. Here in Braj Vrindavan. Okay. So here, the meaning of this verse, the helpless destitute practitioner expresses his humble plea. Devotion that is free from deception is always combined with an attitude that I am extremely destitute and wretched. Sri Rupa Goswami exclaims, you are roaming freely in the pleasure groves in Sri Vrindavan, enjoying love like the greatest of intoxicated elephants. Oh, Radharani, please show me your face and the face of your beloved and kindly bestow your mercy upon me. So, we talked about that in previous verses, so we can be free from all bad qualities, but still this deceptive nature and makes us think that we're advanced. It makes us think that we're okay. It makes us think that we can uh, accept honor, place, and prayer, and, and, uh, and uh, position, and at the same time, and take advantage of that to propagate our own ideas on how to enjoy the material and spiritual life. Now, it's saying, oh, Davy, Varani, falling on the ground like a run, I'm an extremely distressed soul. Begging, please count me as one of your near and dear ones. So if you haven't been here for the first seven verses, this is going to be really hard. <laughs> it's going to be really hard for you to understand this, because this, is, this whole thing is progressive. So now, but you can listen anyway, and by listening you can understand something. That now, after freeing oneself from all bad qualities, still thinking that I'm low, now I'm begging for your mercy. I want to enter into Sri Vrindavanda. It's the Bodhu Srimati Radharani. Those who are dear to Radharani are dear to Krishna. So begging, he's begging his mind. He says, oh mind, please worship Giridhari. Giri, who's Giridhari? He's the owner of Govardhan Hill. Mm. Give me, I'm a cheater. I'm a, saying that I am showing that I'm in one way, but behind the scenes I'm something else. The Lord's mercy can drive away my inherent wicked nature. What is that wicked nature? that in the name of devotional service, we are trying to achieve something material, something temporary. 
man's wickedness. That's what he describes as wickedness. Now, I don't want that anymore. I'm through with that. I want your lotus feet. I want Shelton, Krishna, and Sri Vrindavan down. Inspire my heart. See, what he's saying is, I can't do it. And this is very important to understand. By our own efforts, we cannot exceed, succeed in devotional service. It's not possible. Our efforts are one thing. The mood that, come, that connects with our efforts, not only the efforts, but the strong mood of desire to have the mercy of the Lord, awakens Krishna's compassion. And Krishna arranges for his mercy to come. And what is that mercy? He allows one to come closer to him in devotional service. So our efforts are what we say, the thing that pushes Krishna to act. Only when he sees sincerity and he sees utter and complete helplessness. In the material world, you're taught that you have to be competent, you have to be self, what we say, motivated, you have to be number one, you have to do it, you have to have that kind of like shakti to really drive your way through and make things happen, right? And if you're good at that, you get a good position. And you're going to control other people. But in spiritual life, it's the opposite. The more you feel helpless, the more you could cry out for the mercy of the Lord. And anybody can feel helpless because when we understand we're in a situation of helplessness, we need the Lord's mercy, we need the Lord's compassion, we need the association of devotees. Then that mood of crying out with other, the word is, uh, there's no other, I don't want anything else, I want this. Satyananda Maharaj makes a nice point that when you feel in that helpless position, but at the same time you don't feel the mercy coming, Sometimes you look to feel, to fill that gap with something material. And then you divert your whole attention away from that just to fulfill that gap of helplessness. But a devotee remains in that mood, praying for the Lord, knowing by that prayer the Lord will sooner or later show his mercy. That's what he's saying here. And what does he want? He doesn't want a good position. He doesn't want to be known as a great devotee. He doesn't want to be, uh, he doesn't want anything that is about him. He wants to serve the Lord in Vrindavan, worshiping the king of all personalities, Sri Krishna, who is the lifter of Govindaya. Kiridari himself. That's what he wants. He understands. He's in knowledge, but at the same time he's begging for the position. Please give me that opportunity. He has the knowledge that if I can attain your lotus feet, then everything else, and everything I do in life has become successful. That is my success, to get to your lotus feet. So he tells his mind, with pleading words, now you have to understand one thing, this is important to understand. He's, we want one thing, the mind wants something else. You ever have that experience? <laughs> the mind will tell you so many things, but the soul, or the, the soul that is in, in rash, or with Krishna, it's like sometimes you can be in a kirtan, and you can be experiencing nice things, all of a sudden, the mind will go someplace, and then all of a sudden, you're no longer in the cure time. <laughs> and you think, what happened? <laughs> and that's the nature of the mind. So he wants his mind to cooperate. So in this, in this particular verse, he's saying, with pleading words. In previous verses, he calls his mind the ruffian. In other words, he calls it my dear brother. In other words, he calls it a cheater. 
So in dealing with the mind, you use different uh, adjectives to get the mind to listen. Sometimes you're friendly, sweet, full of flattery. Because when you're dealing with a, a cheater, the mind is a cheater. He's a rascal. And he'll take you wherever you want, he wants to go. And you know whether you want to go or not, you're there. <laughs> you, the soul, was being dragged by the really crazy mind to wherever it wants to do. And therefore, he's begging his mind, I know what I want. I want shelter of Krishna and Vrindavan and loving service eternally at his lotus feet. You want to do something else, mind. So this Shastra is unique and it says that he's telling you what is the highest. And he's preaching from that point and using his mind to show how the mind doesn't want that. It wants something else. And it needs to be cajoled, flattered, uh, chastised. So many nice, so many ways to reach the mind, to get the mind to listen to what I want, me, the soul. If we listen to our mind, we're gone, we're lost. If we listen to the words of Rodinas Goswami, we gradually move our mind closer to the lotus feet of Lord and devotional service. So, now in this verse, he's expressing the inner mood of Vaishnava, who has tasted, he's already he's tasted a sweet drop of the, of the sweetness of the divine couple, mercy, and now he's begging for more. It's like when you get something in a really nice preparation. It's like you're sitting down and somebody's cooked a nice pizza. And they bring in this nice hot pizza made just the way you like it. And then you eat the first piece and you're ready for more. And they say, there's some more. <laughs> oh. So you don't know what to do from there. You're just lost. So he's he's tasted the drop. Now he wants more. But he realizes in order to get more, he has to be more humble and more in the mood of begging for it. Krishna wants that. Krishna wants to see how bad we want him. And the more you want him, you have to show you want him by how much you serve the Vaishnavas and how much you're willing to accept his mercy in whatever way it comes. And then Krishna is happy. And he says here, the helpless, helpless, or helpless, destitute practitioner expressing his humble plea, plea, devotion free from deception is always combined with the attitude that I am extremely destitute and wretched. Nobody likes to hear, you're wretched. If somebody called you a wretch, I mean, what would you think? Hey, who are you? <laughs> but he's called, he's, he feels like that, and he's expressing that mood of being a wretch, and that's what opens up the door for more mercy. And then, here, we go on to glorify the Srimati Radharani. So the whole, this whole verse is just beautiful prayers to Srimati Radharani, glorifying her position, her qualities, and her service to Krishna. And in that verse he says, Sri Gandharvya, Gandharvika, that's Radharani. Inspire my heart with the process to worship Sri Gandharvika. He's not asking for worship of Krishna. He wants Radharani's mercy. He wants to serve Radharani. He wants to please Radharani. He wants to glorify Srimati Radharani. So this verse is about getting the shelter of Srimati Radharani's lotus feet. And then the last part of the verse. It says, when you realize your position, 
The more you realize your position, the more you realize how much you are in need of mercy. It's like sometimes I remember in the old days of Krishna consciousness, the devotees would be joining the movement and there'd be a lot of enthusiasm. And that enthusiasm would take the form of surrendering to whatever was asked. Getting up early in the morning, taking the cold showers, going to the Mangalarti, chanting your japa, going out on Sankirtan or doing whatever service you're doing, going on like this month after month and you're feeling the mercy of the Lord and you're really inspired. And then after a year of doing that, you're starting to think, hey, I made it to the top. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> I'm a pure devotee. <laughs> I can just see how I'm acting, there's no question. I am pure. Just see. We used to call that PDS, pure devotee syndrome. <laughs> Syndrome is not a nice word. <laughs> and then after the second year, it's a whole different story. <laughs> and you realize all your narcotics are starting to come out. So, it's, but the devotee always thinks, the more they make progress in Krishna consciousness, the more they feel that they need the mercy of the Lord. They never consider themselves Successful, they always consider themselves expert at begging for more and more mercy. And this is where this is what Raghunath Das Goswami is saying. That I've tasted a drop of that mercy, now I want more. And how do I get it? I have to cry for it. And I have to beg that person who is the king of all mercy, who lives Sri, who who is the ruler of Sri Vrindavan down, Srimati Radharani herself. And if I can get her mercy, I have achieved all mercy. So he's begging for Radharani's mercy. There's no pride. There's no, what we say, uh, there's no pretense. Everything is done with complete humility in a mood of receiving the mercy. So this is the eighth verse. And what is that mercy? To get the nectar of love of God. And he starts the verse and says that if you, if you, my dear Lord, can drive away this wicked nature and inspire my heart with divine love, then I can worship Srimati Radharani. So he begs to become purified in order to receive the service of Srimati Radharani as a mother of endowment. And this whole verse is full of glorifications. And I'll read the very end of Bhakti Vinod Thakur's um, commentary. The land of Raj is a wish-fulfilling gem. Indeed, it's a jewel mine of consciousness and bliss. For Sri Krishna's eternal, sweet, playful pastimes manifest. Krishna thought, if I can bring Vrindavan and make it manifest on this earth, then I can give the greatest and most secret treasure to the souls there. He did that. My Krishna is an ocean of mercy. Mercy, O oh heart, keep wandering in Vraj ceasing and cry out for Krishna in despair. You are in the grips of illusionary delights, reveling in the mundane romance and found evil in the place in your heart. You became a master cheater, forgetting your own duties, and begged and began to foster eager in your own heart. Now listen to these instructions. Sing the glory of the divine Christian couple and cry right here in the pastures of Raj. When Giridari listens to such pitiful weeping, he will cleanse me of all my faults. He will give me that bright and shining sweetness of love, easily showing me the way to worship Sri Sri Radha in Vrindavan. When Rupa and Raghunath have mercy on me, they will teach me all these mysteries in secret. So this is deep. This is deep. This is not just for, for those who are just coming to eat prasad. <laughs> it's much deeper than that. It's about opening your heart to that love in the heart 
and trying to experiencing the mercy of Krishna in Sri Vrindavan's house. So that's verse number eight. Any, any questions? I'm going a little quick. Okay, no questions. Go to verse nine. Cool, so you want to ask a question? It would be pretty hard for me to hear you from all the way over there. Somebody, yes, yeah, somebody can translate what he says because I can't hear it so cool. He's, uh, what does he do for you? Just ask your father, he'll tell you everything. <laughs> Verse number nine. Ready? Is this boring? No. No. I mean, it's really deep. Seriously speaking, it's, this is the deepest you can get. This Shastra is the epitome of all spiritual teachers. If you take Shastra and prayers and you milk the essence of those prayers, you got Manashiksha. It's really deep. So. But if you haven't been here for the first seven verses, it's going to be pretty hard. But anyway, something with some benefit can be there. Ready? O oh mind, oh mind. Oh meditate on Krishna. The moon of Vrindavan. The moon of Vrindavan. The moon of Vrindavan. Forest. As the Lord of my leader, Srimati Radharani. Meditate on Sri Radhika as his most dear object of love. Meditate on Sri Lalita as her incomparable friend. Meditate on Sri Vishaka as a foremost guru, distributing the teachings of love. And meditate on Radha Kund and Govardhan as the giver of sight and love of Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. So now he's telling his mind what to do. Meditate in Mangrindan, meditate on Radharani, meditate on Lalita, meditate on Vishaka, meditate. Radha-kuna, meditate on Govardhan Hill. In other words, put to your mind, Prabhupada's, somebody, sometimes Prabhupada would say, you have to think of something. Why don't you think of Krishna? <laughs> the mind has to have something to think about. In other words, the mind is always trying to think about so many things. Why not think about Krishna? If you, if you think about Krishna, you can be sure that your mind's in the best place. <laughs> and if you put it somewhere else, you're not sure what will happen. <laughs> Sometimes people think, if, if, I can, if I think about Krishna all the time, I'll never get anything done. How do I function? If you think about Krishna, every, all the time you'll get those things done that you're supposed to get done, and you'll forget those things that you're not supposed to do. <laughs> That's why we don't meditate on Krishna, because <laughs> we want to do those things we're not supposed to do. So therefore, by remembering Krishna, Krishna takes charge of the devotee. So this is a little bit about verse 9. And here he's also saying, meditate on Vishaka. Now from the pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in, uh, in Puri, and he wanted to go to South India. Sarvabhava Bhattacharya said, my dear Lord, please stop at the place called Kalbor. And there's one very interesting personality. I didn't understand him, but now after I have met you and understand what, who you are, 
Now I understand he is a great devotee. Please meet him. And that was Ramananda Roy. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu followed that and met Ramananda Roy. Ramananda Roy was a Kayasta. He was a sutra. He was a government official. He had some position. But he was actually one of the highest and most elevated devotees on the planet at that time. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu met them. And there's a beautiful story of what happens when he meets them, when he meets Ramananda Roy. As soon as they met, their eternal love for each other erupted and they embraced and loving, and loving sentiments. But because they were in public, they were embarrassed. So seeing others were watching the embrace, they calmed down. And then Mahaprabhu said, we should meet here tomorrow. So they did. And then when they met, Lord Chaitanya asked Ramananda Roy, what is the highest form of worship? Now here is the Lord asking a parent governor who's a, who's a sutra, what is the highest form of worship? And Ramananda Roy speaks, and he speaks from one stage to another. He first he says, by worship Van Ashram Dharma, following the Van Ashram system, he quoted a verse from the Padma Purana. Or Chaitanya said, that's external. <laughs> and he quoted another verse, Yarkarosi Arnasi Yachahosi Dadasi Yatapasi Takuntaya. Purusha Sharatim. Everything you do, all that you wash, all that you eat, all that you give away, every austerity you perform should be done as a service to me. Architani said, that's nice, but that's external. <laughs> then he said, Sarva Dharma predicts that Jamma may come, surrender everything to Krishna, become his devotee, give up everything. And Lord Chaitanya said, that's external. <laughs> and then he went on, going higher and higher. Finally, he, get to, he got to Vrindavan. And then the Lord was really pleased, is there more? And he mentions the different rasas in Vrindavan, and he gets to Madhurya Ras, and he speaks about the gopi's love for Krishna. And then when he gets to that point, he stops, and Lord Chaitanya says, I know there's something more, please tell me. And he said, no one has beyond, ever gone beyond this point, of, but if you want to hear, I will speak. But actually, I'm not speaking. I, my mouth is moving, but you are giving me the words to speak. You are actually speaking these words. I am simply your instrument. And then he starts speaking about Radharani's love for Krishna. And then Lord Chaitanya got absorbed. And so that's a beautiful... Who was Ramananda Roy? And this is the question. He was Vishaka, the eternal loving companion of Srimati Radharani is Vrindavan, who manifested himself in this world as the associate of Mahaprabhu as Ramananda Roy. And when Lord Chaitanya had two very dear, intimate, eternal associates. That was Ramananda Roy and Srutamara Goswami. And who was Srutamara Goswami? Zalita. So Radharani enters into the body of Krishna and becomes Mahaprabhu, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nahiyanya. And Mahaprabhu, in the mood of Radha Rani, is exhibiting devotion to Krishna. And now he's associating with those personalities who are his eternal associates in the spiritual world, Lalita and Vishaka. And Vishaka is now speaking to Srimati Radha Rani, who is in the who is who, speaking to Krishna, who is in the mood of Srimati Radharani, about Radharani's love for Krishna. That's in the 8th chapter of Madhya Lila. Please read that. In 1940s, Srila Prabhupada wrote a book. Our Srila Prabhupada wrote a book about this whole pastime. That book's available in certain places in this country. Prabhupada wrote a book. In the 1940s, before he even came to the West, on this particular pastime, and he very nicely explains and expands 
this wonderful loving conversation where you can understand the different stages of bhakti and how it ultimately comes to the stage of Vrindavan and then goes higher into the elements of sweeter and sweeter relationships with Krishna ending with Radharani's love for Krishna. And so, therefore, Raghunath goes Das Goswami is saying, meditate on Vishaka, <laughs> meditate on Lalita, meditate on Radha Kund. Vrindavan, sometimes we say, if you can achieve Vrindavan, that's the highest, but it's not the highest. Vrindavan is not the highest. What's higher? Govardhan. What's higher than Govardhan? Radha Kund. You can't go any higher. One who achieves Radha Kun, of course. We're not talking about physically residing there, although that is one of the understandings. We're talking about developing the mood of bhakti where your consciousness is Vrindavan. And this is what Raghunath Das Goswami is saying. Bring your mind to Vrindavan. Bring your mind to the lotus feet of the Lord and meditate. It's so hard to meditate. It is. <laughs> but if we have good japa every day, that will strengthen the mind and bring the mind more and more to the lotus feet of law. It really depends on our japa. The strength and quality of our chanting brings our consciousness closer and closer to Krishna in the mood of loving service to Krishna. It centers on that, but it also centers on what is our relationship with Vaishnavas. And the relationships, as we were mentioned in verse number seven, unless we serve the Vaishnavas in a humble way to please the Vaishnavas, one cannot progress beyond a certain level of devotional service. One cannot enter into the mood of Vrindavan, because the mood of Vrindavan is selfless love. What is selfless love? Always using oneself for the pleasures of others. In this material world, everyone uses others for the pleasure of themselves. They call that love. <laughs> People get married. What are you going to do for me? <laughs> it's not what am I going to do for you. Well, yeah, I'll do something for you, but more importantly, what are you going to do for me? So this is the material consciousness. And the spiritual consciousness is what, what can I do for you even if you don't do anything for me? You see, love works in such a way is that when you give love, the happiness of giving love is the satisfaction you receive. It's not so much the reciprocation is also the element of happiness. But by giving love, then one is fulfilling their position because the nature of the soul is to love. The nature of the soul is to serve in the mood of loving relationships. So he's begging. Here's how I get the mercy. I meditate on these great personalities. I meditate on, let's see, meditate on Radharani as a dear most object of love. Not only you meditate, but he gives you a way of meditation. He says, think about Radharani as the greatest, the leader of my Lord, Sri Krishna. When you think about Radha Radha, you can think how much love she has for Krishna. And when you think about Krishna, you can think about how much he loves Radha Rani. Think about Radha Rani's friend, Lalita, as her best of all friends. And think about Radha Rani's friend as Vishaka, as the best of all teachers of spiritual knowledge. Think about Radha Kun as the highest form of worship. Think about Govardhan Hill that gives great happiness simply by seeing it. Have you ever seen Govardhan? Just looking at it is like, 
whoa. It's really, it just captures the mind, it captures the heart. Because it's Krishna in the form of a hell. It's Krishna's love for Radharani in the form of a hell, actually. So this is what he's praying. So I'll read. You know, this whole section here is just glorifications of Radharani. This whole verse. And Lalita and Vishaka. And this is verse number nine. And I'll end with Papi Vinanta Kaur's he says, my goddess, Sri Radha, is the moon of the forest of Vrindavan, the ruler of Vrindavan. I cherish and hold the feet of Sri Lalita, the divine couple's intimate friend who is beyond compare, as well as the feet of Sri Vishaka, the beloved teacher. O oh heart, meditate on them like this. This lake, Radhakum, Govardhan, king of mountains, the sight of these places give love to the viewer. Dear mind, taking the body of a cowherd, mating in Vraj, and taking shelter of the maid servant, do whatever service you have, receive according to her guidance. In other words, follow her instructions and serve accordingly. If you get the mercy of the mantras, you will attain the Shaki's lotus feet, and then the Shaki's will show every kind of pleasure. So the mantras never associate with Krishna. They're always association with Radharani and making arrangements for Radha and Krishna to me. But Krishna, but the Radharani's friends, the gopis, the sakis, they also have a relationship with Krishna. So who, who is more intimate with Radharani, the mantras or her friends? Both are intimate. But there's a different mood of relationship. One is serving her lotus feet to please her. The other one is serving her, but also having wonderful pastimes with Krishna. It's interesting. Sometimes and the, the mantras are more intimate than the friends because sometimes you don't want to let your friends know what intimate relationships you're having with those who are serving you. It's a little bit of a different mood. So we're we'll both are very dear to Radharani. Serve constantly according to the Astakala Lila, the eight times of the day. And then he goes on, please honor these words of Bhakti Vrindavan and push away all my anarchists and give me the divine ras of Vrindavan. So I know this is a little deep <laughs> and a little bit rasika, but it shows us what is the goal of this movement. If we don't know what word the goal is, then we don't really know how to execute devotional service. Prabhupada said that our goal of this movement is to develop love the divine couple, Sri Sri Radha and Krishna, in Vrindavan. And Raghunath Das Goswami, in these prayers, is showing us the way. Any questions on verse number nine? Start there. You don't start there. When you get trained up as a, as a as a as a female maid servant, you enter a particular group, and they train you to serve accordingly. When you become approved by the group leader, then you get the opportunity to meet Radharani, and if Radharani is pleased with you, then you can engage in her service. You don't go right there. Uh, that uh, maybe if, if someone has another uh, type of uh, 
Then they will they will take shelter of Krishna's su superior counter voice. But even if they worship Radharani and their mood is in, sh in, in friendship, by the strength of their worship, they will be shown where they are to serve. So this verse is not for them? It's, or it's for everybody. It's for but it pushes you. Yeah. Just like we're practicing devotional service now. But at a certain point, when we reach spontaneous devotional service, then you start cultivating a particular mood in your heart. Like in cultivation, if that mood is not your mood, simply by the following that of that mood of cultivation, following in the footsteps of an eternal residence of Vrindavan, that personality will will guide you to your soul of your eternal position like that. You make the endeavor to follow the process, and the process will guide you accordingly. It's very personal. Right. The Prophet said, Prabhupada said, when you're ready, the spiritual master will come and tell you what is your eternal relationship with Krishna and the spiritual world. But that comes on the spontaneous platform. Not only on the spontaneous, there's Raganuga Bhakti and then there's Rat, there's Raganuga Bhakti with Rati. Rati means attachment. When Raganuga Bhakti matures into a later stage, is called Ragatmika Bhakti. And then one is very strongly attached to serving in a certain way. And that becomes their mood. So there's, there's different stages even with spontaneous devotional service. It matures into attachment in a particular way. That attachment becomes focused. Is that clear? Well, when you get to the stage of Raghunuga the Bhakti, then you have to aspire to take shelter of an eternal associate in Vrindavan. And you pray to that person, you glorify that person, you hear about their pastimes. That person will guide you in your spiritual life. And then, if that, and then, through that guidance, you'll be led to where you're supposed to be. That only happens on, it doesn't happen in Vaidhi Bhakti. It only happens on Raghunuga Bhakti. Vaidhi Bhakti is simply rules and regulations. That's what we're doing now. It's just like, I have to do something is rule and regulation. I want to do something is spontaneous. That's the difference. Devotional service is only spontaneous. Having to do it is, is the training part. It's the training part. I have to chant my rounds. I have to be a nice devotee. But when you start, after practicing long enough, the heart becomes open, the material layers start to gradually diminish, the anarthas, and then the natural what we say, nature of the soul starts to come. And the soul is by nature spontane spontaneously attracted to Krishna. So our love for Krishna is like a raging river. It's going in that direction, doesn't go anywhere else. But it's hidden by our association with matter. And rules and regulations help you to practice that move which will get rid of these until you reach the platform of spontaneity, spontaneity. When you begin spontaneity and devotional service, you're actually fixed in the process. But it all centers around chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> Just keep doing that. Yeah, yes, the victory. Oh, I'm sorry, Michelle. I'm sorry, Michelle. So, can we understand it, uh, that this devotional service um, and association with devotees and our uh, closest personalities could uh, bring us uh, step by step to this stage? Yeah. Can we take it as an example on this earth and this body? 
Do we take what is being said here as the way to go? Is that what you're saying? Um, I mean, if we could state it as a uh, small example of uh, showing a love to, to the others through uh, the service. If showing... You... I, I missed one or two words. Mm. You can just talk really strong English. <laughs> you don't have to, based on that question you asked me this morning. Just let it go. <laughs> You remember her question this morning. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, when we associate with devotees, sometimes it comes a little bit hard, a little bit uh, less sweet, sometimes more sweet, and it uh, brings us uh, to the next part, step by step, up uh, to the higher place to get the love of uh, Krishna, I don't know, Krishna. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> You know, you associate, you chant, gradually you're purifying your heart. Prabhupada said the more you stay in devotional service, the more you become purified. As soon as you stop associating and stop practicing, then you go back down. It's you're either going up or you're going down. You can't stay in one place. You can't stay in one place. It's like a river. A river is, dri is driving in a certain direction. And you're in the river. If you're going with the river, it's easy. If you're going against the river, then you have to struggle. Going in devotional service means going against the river of material tendencies. So that means you have to work for it. <laughs> and then at one point, when you start becoming a master swimmer in the river against the material energy, then all of a sudden the boat comes. <laughs> and that is the boat of the mercy of Vrindavan, and then you jump in the boat and it becomes easy to go against the current. Did you follow that analogy? Okay. So Vitri? Yeah, you have to achieve perfection when you bathe, but when you get out, what do you do after that? You're already, yeah, you're liberated at that, that point, but then you go back to doing the same old things you used to do. <laughs> this is what happens. You stay in the temple, don't go anywhere, January Krishna, you're, you're free. You go back out, do your same nonsense. And whatever you do here, you lose, you lose some of that. You stay in the fire of emotional service, you remember it. You but the tendency is we go back and we don't change our habits, we don't change our ways. Devotional service, especially if you Radha Kun, you need an experience. We went there with Sachinandana Maharaj many years ago. And he was leading us on a how to enter Radhakuna in, in a right consciousness. He spoke for a half hour, explaining what is the mood for getting the mercy of bathing in Radhakuna. Not just you go in and just get wet and come out. There's a certain mood. When you enter, you're in a mood of prayer. You're in, it's a very prayerful mood. When you, when you come out, you feel like there's, none, there's no material desires left. That is the feeling of bathing in Radhakuna, in the right consciousness. Again, the internal mood as opposed to just performing the activities. When Prabhupada went with his disciples in the early 1970s, the devotees were playing in Radhakuna. Prabhupada got so angry. He said, stop it. He says, now don't go in Radhakuna anymore. They were in the wrong mood. 
It's like you go on the altar to do RT and you just push the TD over. <laughs> you have to be in the right mood. So this is Bhakti. Bhakti is teaching us not only the activity, but what is the mood? What is the right mood? The mood is helplessness and a mood of service. Yes. Uh, does it mean we have to wait for the right mood? No, you act? Have, no, you have to make the right mood happen. Make the right mood happen by devotional service. And by taking the philosophy and applying it. The philosophy tells you what is the right mood, you simply do it. You feel like being angry? Be humble. You feel like enjoying your senses? Serve Krishna. In other words, don't listen to your materialistic mind telling you what to do. Do what the spiritual master tells you and do it with an attitude of service. And then you have the right mood. You get it. We, a mood is something you can bring about, and the more you practice the mood, the more the mood becomes prominent. If you don't practice the mood, it becomes hard to develop that mood. So devotional service is to practice the activity with the right mood. Both, not just the activity, but with the right mood. Does that help? Thank you. Okay, should I go on to the next verse? Okay, ready? <clears> oh <throat> mind, oh offer your worship unto Sri Radhika, the beloved of Lord Hari. She outshines Rati, the wife of Kamadev. Gauri, the wife of Lord Shiva. And Leela, the potency of Lord Vishnu. By her intelligence and her beauty. She defeats Sachi, the wife of Indra. Lakshmi and Satya, Krishna's wife, by the ways of her good fortune. She defeats the pride of the newly married gopis of Raj through her power to control Krishna. Without Radharani being approached before Krishna, Krishna's absence. Radharani's extraordinary quality. Rupa Goswami mentions in Ujjwala Nilamani her qualities. One, should I read her qualities? Would you like to hear Radharani's qualities? Yes. She has unlimited qualities, but 25 are outstanding. One, she's very sweet. Two, she's always freshly youthful. Three, her eyes are restless. Four, she smiles brightly. Five, she has beautiful, auspicious lines. Six, she makes Krishna happy. Seven, she is very expert in singing. Eight, her speech is charming. Nine, she is very expert in joking and speaking very pleasantly. Ten, she is very humble and meek. She is always full of mercy. She is cunning, expert in her duties, shy, respectful, calm, graceful, great, grave, and expert in enjoying life. She's ecstatic at the topmost leader of ecstatic love. She's a reser of the loving affairs in Gokul, the most famous of all submissive devotees. She is very affectionate to elderly persons, very submissive to the love of her friends. She is the chief gopi and she always keeps Krishna under control. So this is way beyond my realization here. But anyway. So she is full of all good qualities. So we take shelter of Shumati Radharani. Prabhupada writes in that song, when he came over on the Java Duty, he wrote a song 
Right. It's called. What is the name of this song? No, it's not that one. It's another one. Where's Where's uh, Vishnu Premier She knows. See here. What is that song? Uh, Serenity to the lotus feet of the uh, to the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. That's the name of the song in English. But when Prabhupada writes in the first line, Radharani Sukihapi. That when Radharani is pleased with you, oh no, he says only when Radharani is pleased with you, only then will your devotional service be successful. So she's the best of all gopis. Any questions? I mean, this is a little deep. <laughs> We're going beyond our realizations here. <clears throat> and then the next verse, that was a complete glorification of Radharani in that verse. And in verse number 11, ready? Oh mind, oh mind, you should every day drink the five nectars. Nectar. Worship, worship, glories, glories, meditation, meditation, listening to divine pastimes, and offering obeisances. Worship Govardhan according to the rules. In this way, follow the instructions of Sri Rupa and obtain the direct service of Sri Sri Radha Giridhari, who are captivated by the God of amorous love in the company of the associates of Raj. So here it's mentioning ten things you did, should do. Lord, say, Lord Krishna is always surrounded by his confidential friends and associates, Sri Dham, Subal, Radharani. Absorbed in the attractive amorous pastimes. In other words, hear about Krishna's leaders. Achieve direct service to Braj. And he goes on to explain, worship the Lord, glorify the Lord, meditate upon the Lord, hear about the Lord, offer obeisances to the Lord, offer worship to Govardhan Hill. Many devotees go every year to Govardhan Hill. You've seen the Govardhan Parikrams? Sometimes the sadhus who live in on Govardhan, they do what is called uh, circumambulation of Govardhan Hill. Overland Hill is 14 miles around. And they take 108 rocks and they begin at one point, I'm not sure where they begin. I think they might begin at Radhakund or Shamakund. And then they offer obeisances in that one spot 108 times. And they take, and they put a rock every time they offer obeisances. Then they move to where the pile of 108 rocks is and they start paying 108 more obeisances on that place. And then they put rocks in the next section. And then it takes them months, but they go around the whole Govardhan Hill like that. And that is one of the recommended ways to worship Govardhan. Those who are not so devoted do it only eight times in one place. And those who are even less devoted do it once. <laughs> and uh, I've seen them. They have piles of rocks and they're just paying on noises. So Govardhan is none different than Krishna. Mm -hmm. Who is Govardhan? When Krishna manifested Govardhan Hill, he said to Radharani, Radharani wanted a place where they could have their intimate pastimes and Krishna manifested Govardhan from his heart. 
So Govardhan is actually the heart, of, is a love for, for Radharani, Krishna's love for Radharani manifested in that hill. That's Govardhan. And that hill came to this material world to assist Krishna in his pastimes, along with the Jamuna River, both are eternal residents of the spiritual world. Jamuna is gradually drying up and Govardhan is gradually sinking. Why? Because Krishna has left. And gradually they're leaving go slowly and pretty soon, not pretty soon, but after some time Govardhan will be gone and so Jamuna will also be gone. To, to again return to the spiritual world. They're there in their spiritual body, but they manifested themselves here to assist the Lord in his pastimes in Bola Vrindavan. So this is... So by filling our minds and hearts with these instructions, Become a follower of Sri Rupa and his companions, one who sweetly, with a sweet voice, loudly recites these 11 supreme verses, which gives instructions to the mind and strives to understand all of their meaning complete, uh, completely, attains the incomparable jewel of worshiping Sri Sri Radha and Krishna in the forests of Gokul. So I highly recommend the devotees to get a copy of this book. It was just recently released. It's called Sri Manashiksha. And it's the, each verse is a commentary by Bhakti Vinod Thakur, which is called Bhajana Darpana. Bhajana means your worship, and Darpana means mirror. Looking at your worship, taking a look. He calls that his commentary, along with commentaries by the his Kanacharyas, and his four or five his Kanacharyas who give their seminars on this particular beautiful verse. So I'm really inspired by this. I don't know. Sachinandana Maharaj writes at the beginning of this, I wish I read it to the devotees once before. Maybe I'll read it again. Should I read it again what he said? Yes. You want to hear what Maharaj said? He said, this is the introduction. I read Manashiksha many years ago with various learned commentaries, but it struck me only recently how essential this book is. At, the, at that time, I had removed myself a little bit from my normal busy preaching pace, pace doing extensive studies into our philosophy and into the question of how to present Krishna consciousness to a postmodern audience. I asked myself, do we have, in our tradition, a guidebook to bhakti in its different stages, a book which will bring a person from the beginning to perfection? As I was asking and looking around, essentially, to find a book which would save me the tremendous work of writing something myself, I again and again came upon Mother Shiksha. Then His Grace Rupa Ravinda Sarupa, who told me that Mother Shiksha is the guidebook which takes us to full Krishna consciousness. But I was still a little doubtful whether or not that this is really the book, the guidebook to Krishna consciousness, until I received a letter from our Srimati Devi Dasi. Srimati presented to me a statement from Bhakti Vinod Thakur's Jaivan Dharma, where he says that Manashiksha is the Padhati for Gaudiya Vaishnava. We call something a padhati, it means a step-by-step -step guide to progress. Pada means foot, hati means progress. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur says it's a commentary to Mana Shiksha called Bhaja Darpana or the mirror bhajan that when a living entity has understood that it is his prime duty in life to develop his Krishna consciousness, when he has awakened his faith in this understanding, he will then ask how to do it. Manashiksha will answer this question. If we, the readers, and I have this question and have awakened some faith that we should develop our Krishna consciousness, then we are qualified to hear the secrets of this guidebook. So that's from the section of the Maharaj. Any questions? We can even go back to some of the early verses for those of you who were here. Mm -hmm. 
Madhurya Kandamini is also a guidebook, but in a very direct and focused way. Shila Prabhupada and Kija. It's a very direct and focused way. Krishna Chakravarti Thakur mentions Madhurya Kandambini. It's very similar, but here Madhurya Kandambini doesn't really focus on achieving Vrindavan and the details that it takes in order to achieve Vrindavan. Rupa Goswami mentions in his Bhakti Rasama to Sindhu, the Bhakti contains nine stages. Vadal Strata, Sadhu Sangha, Bhajana Kriya, Anartana Vritti, Nishta Rujta, Kashakti, Bhava, Prema. As we go through the different stages, we start to recognize that there is a next stage that I have to achieve. Just like devotees took initiation today. So what is what stage is that? That's called Bhajana Kriya. By association, by faith, we associate, by association we practice, and by practice we develop the desire to make the practice a lifetime affair. Then we take we look for Krishna's representative, we take shelter of Krishna's representative, we take the initiation vows, and then the spiritual master takes charge of the devotee and guides them step by step through the next the next stages. The next stage is that we have many unwanted things in our heart, both in activity and desire. So the spiritual master gives you guidance and directions on how to practice at the same time he helps you to remove those blocks, which are called anarthas, or unwanted uh, things in our devotional practice. When 75% of those anarthas are removed, we can move to the next stage and become nishta. Nishta means fixed. It means I'm fixed in my devotional service. I still may have material desires, but I'm not deviated by those desires. When one becomes fixed and that stage develops even stronger, he goes to the next stage, which is Ruchi. Ruchi is, what is that verse? Prasanna Atman Nasoshiti Nakamshiti. What is the first one? Brahmabhuta. Brahmabhuta. Prasanna Atman Nasoshiti Nakamshiti Sama Sarveshi Bhuteshu Madhbhakti Lamate Param. Prasanna Atman. Prasanna means joyful, Atma means the self. When one is on that stage, they feel joyful, associate and consciously. I don't hanker for anything and don't lament for anything that's lost. On that stage, they, they can render devotional service to the Lord. When that stage becomes developed, then one develops attachment for Krishna. One cannot do anything else but serve Krishna and make them. wants to hear about Krishna more, wants to serve Krishna, wants to only associate with the devotees of Krishna. A devotee on that stage will get angry if he wastes or she wastes a moment doing anything else but devotional service. That's one of the symptoms of that stage. That the devotee is so fixed on Krishna that to do something else or to become diverted to something else causes the devotee to feel great unhappiness. He feels sorry for wasting time, gets back up and says, I'll never do that again. <laughs> gets, gets involved, starts to hear more about Krishna. As he hears more, the heart opens up. He starts to serve Krishna. He starts following the instructions of Raghunath Das Goswami by meditating on the pastimes of the Lord, meditating on the eternal associates of the Lord, meditating on their service to Krishna and Vrindavan. And then he develops what we call preliminary love of God. The heart starts to open and becomes soft. When the heart becomes completely soft, love starts to flow to Krishna unimpeded. But it's still not complete. Although it is full of affection, it hasn't reached a mature stage. By practicing that, 
and by focus and by hearing more about Krishna and meditating on Krishna, praying to Krishna, thinking about Krishna, if one becomes absorbed in Krishna, then pure love for Krishna develops. And then that is the final stage, and then pure love of Krishna has eight stages. And it goes more concentrated. It's like you take sugar, and you can take sugar in its very simple stages, and then higher than that is molasses, and then there's gore, and then higher than that is rock, uh, what is it, uh, rock candy. And Papa said higher than that is lozenges. <laughs> Concentrated sweetness. So there's different stages. So these are the nine stages. So Madhurya Kandamini mentions some of these, but it doesn't really go into detail about the various activities of the book. The two of come to me is a lot about what not to do. Don't, don't offend devotees. Don't criticize devotees. Don't blaspheme devotees. It says if you do, your spiritual life is finished. It's very heavy. Bhakti Vinod Thakur comments on the Durya Kandini, saying this is the word, because he mentions what is called in the second verse things that take away from our progress and the, and the greatest thing is to offend Vaishnavas. One should always praise Vaishnavas, one should never offend them. Even if there is some reason to criticize, one should not. In the, uh, in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, I mentioned this morning in class, 28th chapter of the 11th canto, verses 1 and 2. It gives you a strong injunction. Never praise a Vaishnava, never find fault with a Vaishnava. That's verse 1. In verse 2 it says, but you can praise. <laughs> it's a subtle injunction, because the whole process of devotional service is to praise Krishna. And also, the devotees praise Devotees. Why does it say don't praise in the first verse? And why does it say don't criticize? I was questioning that. It says don't praise and don't criticize. I can understand don't criticize, but why don't praise? What does it mean? And then it goes on to say you can praise. But why would it say not to praise and then go on to say to pray that you can praise? I was trying to find out the answer. I finally found it out. In the Acharya's commentary, which is not in the Bhagavatam, it says that one cannot see the full picture of another person. Therefore, praise and criticism is always wrong. One cannot see the full. It's giving a more of an absolute principle on these, uh, these, uh, these activities. One cannot see the full print. But still, because our process is about glorification, still, you can praise the devotees. You should praise the devotees. But the devotees should not want praise. <laughs> That's the thing. We were talking about that this morning. How a devotee doesn't want praise, but may receive praise, and at the same time, pass that praise on to his spiritual master or spiritual master. Like that. So, but the kind of media is nice, it's deep, but Manushiksha goes even a little farther. Any other questions? There is one devotee who well, somebody has the microphone here. Okay. So when you can, as soon as she's done, then you're next. As I understand, uh, these verses are different stages. Uh, mm -hmm. in that and I was wondering if uh, uh, we should uh, build uh, one stage after another, or some of them may be happening simultaneously. No. For example, no, they, 
you get elements of some of the ones in the first and some of the stages, but you can't reach the next stage until you finish with the previous stage. So, uh, in case of anathas, uh, we are not able to deal with the desire for uh, pain till we we that uh, with uh, with criticism or. You how the how the in, do the inter the an artist interact with each other is that? What? Well, that's very subtle. <laughs> but in Bhajana Rahasya, Bhakti Vinod Thakur gives an understanding. He, he mentions the four types of an artist. And each four types of categories of an artist. And each of the categories has four. So there's 16 an artist. If you get rid of 75%, that means 12 of the 16 in artists, you can move from the platform of an art university to Nishta. But only when you get rid of 75%. What are the things that carry over to the later stages of bhakti offenses? Even on the higher stages of bhakti, one can commit offense. We have the examples, many examples, just like Jai and Vijay were gatekeepers and they committed offense to the four Kumaras. They are on the gates of Vaikuntha, they were personal associates and servants of Lord Narayan. But apparently they committed offense. We have many examples on this level where there was one great uh, what's the word? Protagonist of Srimad Bhagavatam, great orator, he could speak, he had realizations of Bhagavatam. He had many followers, and he would sit down, people would listen, and he could speak so wonderfully of Bhagavatam. And he was on a very high stage, he was on the stage of Baba almost. And he was giving a lecture, and one Mataji, I think her name was Hemangi, or Hemalata, Hemalata, Takurini. She's a great soul. She came in his lecture, and she was attached to chanting Hare Krishna. She sat in the back and was listening to her lecture, but chanting Japa at the same time. He noticed that. He turns his attention to her and says, you're not listening to my lecture. Don't chant, listen. She was so attached to chanting, she, she didn't stop. <laughs> he became angry and started to criticize her. She never responded, just remained humble. She was so attached to chanting that she could not stop chanting. But she could also listen to his lecture while she was chanting. But he, was, he felt offended that she was not paying attention. What happened? He fell down for his criticism of her. Because he acted in a very angry way towards a great soul. When you get angry against great souls, it's a matter of time before you fall down. Sometimes you say, well, I've committed so many offenses against the devotees, I'm not falling down. Just wait. <laughs> It'll catch you. When Lord Chaitanya was here, he speeded up the process of the reactions of offenses and the react and the activities of devotional service. Because when someone offended a devotee, they got leprosy right away. Say, oh, I'm not going to get leprosy. He needs to see how many people I offended. Honey, well, just wait. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. The Shastras don't lie. But what Lord Chaitanya did to show how offenses work and how uh, what we say Bhakti works, he gave instantly the results of these. So people who offended Vaishnavas immediately got reactions, and people who did great devotional service, he immediately gave them love of God. That was because of the presence of Lord Chaitanya. Now he's left his legacy in the form of his instructions. So if we offend devotees, it's a matter of time before that catches up. And if we perform devotional service patiently, 
It's just a matter of time before we get love of God. Sometimes you I won't immediately love of God. Just relax. <laughs> doesn't come like that. Your eagerness is nice, but Rupa Goswami says, enthusiasm, determination, pacienza. You got that, Lila, Linda? Okay, pacienza. What does that mean? Patience. Okay, that's Italiano. <laughs> My mother would always say, pacienza. Come on. <laughs> okay, Ma. <laughs> so yeah, so patience is a virtue. Patience brings the mercy of the Lord. Patience show, is an indication of humility. Because the goal is very wonderful, and it doesn't take, it doesn't come so easily. It comes with steadiness on the practice. If we're steady, that shows for pressure. Okay? But there's different stages. Yes, you have a question. Hare Krishna. Nice to see you again. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. There is a very deep point that you... Um, You've got to get the microphone, so... <laughs> Speak slowly. So, thank you, Sana. Thank you. So, thank, thank you for really incredible lecture. Uh, some very deep points you said that I will meditate for some time on it. And there is a, just one point that is not very clear to me. It is uh, about uh, training ourselves in the mood. So, we know by Srila uh, Prabhupada said also that we should not imitate uh, like uh, pure devotees. So, uh, so, how can you like uh, find this uh, nice fine line between like not being like Sahaja, like imitating in pure devotees, or even like Shaitan I said to some of his followers, when they come to Mathura or down, like don't, uh, not like imitate the, the rich bosses. So, how can we really like train ourselves in the mood and not, not being like a, like a Sahaja or fancy? Well, the mood is different from the activities. The mood is what, what is your consciousness when you perform the activities. So we should stay within the proper activities and not try to surreptitiously or pretentiously jump to the higher stages of bhakti by performing the same activities of the great souls. But Lord Chaitanya gave the mood. Trinata pi sami jena dayori la sarishuna amari amadena kirtaniya sadai. In this verse, Srila Krishna Das Goswami Kaviraj says, take this verse and string it on the nectar of the holy name and wear it as your ornament. So this is the, what we say, the desired character of a devotee. These four principles. Practicing humility, practicing tolerance, practicing giving respects to others and not eager for respect for oneself. If we, this is the mood. If we practice these things, we have developed the right mood. That kind of covers mostly everything. Thank you, thank you, it's clear now, thank you. Okay, thank you, that's a nice question. Yes, Prabhu, Govinda Nandana. As you, as you quoted now, the mood that uh, Lord Chaitanya said we should follow, Dinaha Bhisavichana, at the same time Prabhupada said that uh, we as devotees should be um, uh, independently so thoughtful, uh, self-motivated, and uh, of perfect character. Okay. So if you can just comment this to how it fits it. They completely work together, I think. I don't see any contradictions. It doesn't, humility doesn't, rel re what's the word, relegate one to inaction. Humility doesn't mean I'm stupid. Humility means I take shelter of the Lord and pray for His mercy and depend on Him 
for whatever I do. And then he will infuse you with intelligence and also how to purify your heart. So, independent intelligence means to think how to serve in such a way that you can increase the quality and quantity of your service. You, there's, you can follow the, the standard way of doing things, and that's nice. But if you think, if you have a creative intelligence and you can think how to do that same service even better, or even add other people to the service, because they also get the benefit. In other words, use your intelligence to expand the service. That's creative intelligence. What was the other four things you said? Self-motivated. Self-motivated means uh, means that you depend only on, on the mercy of the spiritual master and the mercy of Krishna coming through the spiritual master. You're not motivated by something material. The self is the soul, not the mind. The mind might get motivated by something external, but the self is only motivated by the instructions given by the Lord to the spiritual master. So focus on that as your form of motivation. And learn how to use those instructions in a practical way. Mm -hmm. Just What's the third one? Uh, the third one is perfect character, which which suits the other one. But my, my question was for the second one. We also uh, find out that self-motivated means you, you don't n need anyone to be pushed. Also. It depends how you see it. In the modern world, that's, that's how people see it. So that's why I'm asking. It may be taking the form of just being aggressive. <laughs> Self-motivated means that I depend on instructions of the spiritual master. Uh, OK, all right, you might use these. I'm just. Self-motivated means I don't need somebody to tell me what to do all the time. <laughs> and I always do the right thing. <laughs> but that's, in the association of devotees, that can happen. Outside the association of devotees, it won't happen. You'll be motivated by something else. You sure? Or are you just surrendering? I just want to make sure I covered it all. Okay. I get these questions a lot. I think you're self-motivated. <laughs> Any other questions? Hmm. Leila? <coughs> it's very nice to hear. Um, the instructions that Raghunath Das Goswami is giving to his mind. Should I read them again? <laughs> sure, For those who he weren't here, I'll read it. We'll read all the verses. Okay. Uh, and I was thinking, like, on a practical level, um, like the mind present situations in um, so many varieties of ways. So, like, should we. Uh, like to apply them on a practical level, should we start writing down or? Yeah. 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 said, to remember means to remember to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have, I mean, to use myself as an example, I have three things to do this. One's long range, which I can't do immediately. One, another one's is more immediate, and then I have a day to day list. So I write down everything. And I, that way I can, 
chance is not for you get ideas, you get realizations, you get so many things. And if you don't write them down, you forget them. Those moments that you get these thoughts or ideas or you know, something, put it on paper. Write it down and go back and you find the right time to carry it out. I, didn't, I told this story twice today. I went to sleep a Friday night at around 9.30. And I woke up at 12 o'clock. And I said, I'm wide awake, what do I do? Chant Java. <laughs> so I started chanting Java at 12 o'clock. And I chanted for a while, and all of a sudden I got a whole bunch of ideas about certain people that could use initiation. <laughs> Second initiation. And these all of a sudden I got a whole bunch of ideas. Almost it was just coming like because it was so peaceful, my mind was pretty much free from everything else. That was it. And then and then I was searching for my flashlight so I could find the paper to write it down. So I found it and I was writing it down. And then the next day I had a list of about four or five things. And then I talked to the devotees here and I said Good idea. So I was just using myself as an example that when you get an idea, you get ideas during japa. It's not that you chant japa to get ideas, but when ideas come during japa, what do you do? If you start keep thinking about the ideas, then you can't chant it, concentrate on your job. Keep a pencil and paper there. Write it down. Forget it. Go back to your job. We get ideas all the time. But if you don't write them down, you forget them. You hear something Prabhupada said, really outstanding, you just think, I gotta remember that. You don't write it down, and you think, mm, what did he say? This is the nature of Kali Yuga to forget things. It's, good, it's a good exercise. Office, especially for the managers. They should write everything down. Do you write everything down? Yeah. Yeah, see? That's why he's still a manager. <laughs> if he didn't write everything down, he'd be being managed instead of managing. You could have a profession where you have to know everything. Right? Write it down. <laughs> Doesn't take much. Or if you have your phone, you can go tee -tee 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 -tee. I don't do that because I don't know how. But anyway, I write it down. Yeah, there's so many. That's like, you might have found some things that I said interesting. If you wrote it down, you remember. Or you can play the tape back. But it's good to take, I know sometimes, People take notes in class and they give certain things. Anybody taking notes now? Oh, wow. There's at least 10 people taking notes. And then you refer back. Oh, and then you can use that in your devotional service. So that's a, that's a handy little technique for remembering because he's writing things down. Okay. Should I read the verses? For those of you who weren't here, and for those of you who were here, there's a section in the back here that has all the verses listed together. Here, okay. <coughs> you ready? Let me get my glasses. In that bag, there should be some glasses. So verse number one, you want to do the, rep the repetition program or should I just read? Just read? Okay. Oh dear brother, oh mind, having given up all pride, please develop unprecedented and excessive attachment to Sri Guru, to Sri Vrindavan, to the abode of the cows, to the devotees residence of Vrindavan, to all the devotees on this planet, to the confidential mantra given by Shri Guru, 
to the holy names of Shishi Radha Krishna and to the process of surrendering to the low, fresh young couple of Raj. Holding your feet, I beseech you with sweet words. Verse 2. Indeed, do not perform any pious acts prescribed in the Vedas and supporting literature, or sinful acts forbidden in them. Staying here in Raj, please perform profuse service to Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. O mind, unceasingly remember the son of Sachi as the son of Nanda Maharaj, and Sri Guru as the dearest servant of Lord Mukunda. Listen, O oh mind, if you desire at every birth to reside in the land of Raj with loving attachment to the servant and serve the youthful couple of Sri Sri Radha Krishna in close proximity, then clearly remember and offer obeisances to Sri Rupa, Sri Sarupa, and his associates in Vrindavan, and to Rupa's elder brother, Sri Sanatan. So in the first three verses, he establishes what we should do. Now in the next four verses, he tells us what we should avoid. O mind, abandon the prostitute of mundane talks who plunders all intelligence. Do not listen at all to the stories of the tigers named Mukti, who devours all souls. Moreover, also give up attachment to the husband of Lakshmi, Sri Narayan, who only leads one to Vaikuntha. Instead, here in Vraj, serve Sri Sri Radha and Krishna who give one the jewel of their own love. Verse 5, while here on the revealed path of devotion, I have been attacked by the gang of my own lust, who have bound my neck with the troublesome, dreadful ropes of wicked deeds. I am being killed. Cry out, oh, piteously, cry out piteously like this to the devotees of Sri Krishna, the destroyer of the Bhakan demon. O oh, mine, they will save you from these enemies. Verse number six. O oh, ruffian mind, why do you burn yourself in me, the soul, by bathing in the trickling urine of a great donkey, or a full-grown hypocrisy and duplicity? Instead, you should always bathe in the ocean of love, emanating from the lotus feet of Sri Sri Gandharva Gidhari, thereby delighting yourself and me. As long as the unchaste dog-eating woman of desire for prestige dances in my heart, how can the chaste and pure lady of love of Krishna touch it? Therefore, O oh mind, you should always serve the incomparable, beloved, devotee commander of Krishna's army, who will immediately throw out the unchaste woman and establish the pure lady of love in your heart. That was nice. Number eight, even though I am a cheater, the Lord's mercy can drive away my inherent wicked nature. Give me the glowing nectar of divine love and inspire my heart with the process of worshiping Sri Gandharvika. Therefore, O oh mind, with pleading words, you should worship Sri Gididhari here in Vrindavan. O oh mind, meditate on Krishna, the moon of Vrindavan forest, as the Lord of my leader, Sri Radhika. Meditate on Sri Radhika as his most dear object of love. Meditate on Sri Lalita as her, as her incomparable friend. Meditate on Sri Vishak as the foremost guru, distributing the teachings of love. And meditate on Radhakun and Govardhan giver, as givers of the sight of love of Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. O mind, offer your worship unto Sri Radhika, the beloved of Lord Hari. She outside shines Rati, Gauri, Leela, by the effulgence of her beauty, she defeats Sachi, Lakshmi, Satya, by the ways of her good fortune. She defeats the pride of the newly married gopis of Raj, headed by Chandra Lali, through her power to control Krishna. O oh, mind, you should every day drink the five nectars, worship, glories, meditation, listen to divine pastimes and offer obeisance. Worship Govardhan according to the rules. In this way, follow the instructions of Sri Rupa Goswami and obtain the direct service of Sri Sri Radha Gidhari, who are captivated by the god of our amorous love and the company of the associations of Raj. Last verse. Becoming a follower of Sri Rupa and his companions, one who with his sweet voice loudly recites these 11 supreme verses, which give instructions to the mind and strives to understand all of their meanings completely, 
obtains the incomparable jewel of worship near Sisi Radha Krishna in the forest of Goku. So that is Sri Mahashik.